Welcome again to everyone uh, to the third session of the Healing Arts Encounters in Arts and Medicine. And today we have um, two wonderful yes. guests with us. Um, one from the field of medicine, one from the field of history or the history of science. Um, I will quickly introduce the two of you, then we have short presentations of 10 to 15 minutes before we enter into a dialogue. Um, so I'll start uh, with you, Edna. Um, uh, Dr. Edna Bonhomme is a historian of science and um, you call yourself a culture writer, I really like that one, and an editor based here in Berlin. You're from the States, originally from Miami. You've uh, wrote a lot of articles, or also creative nonfiction and book reviews, and your writing has appeared in very different outputs like Al Jazeera, The Atlantic, Esquire, Freeze, The Guardian, The Nation, Wyatt, and many others. Um, you um, have an interesting educational background because um, you are a graduate of Princeton University's PhD program um, in history. You have a master in global health, and you have a bachelor in biology which is actually really nice and interesting also about the American system, that you can actually have such an educational career. This would be much more difficult uh, in a German or European um, academic system. Um, and um, there's a book, or your new book, A History of the World in Six Plagues, is forthcoming, but what you just published and which just came out was a book that you co-edited called After Sex which is an anthology about um, kind of reproductive justice. But the way I came across your work uh, was actually three years ago in 2020, where you did an exhibition um, together with uh, Nena Onuha um, called Cartographies of Care. And in this exhibition, you charted kind of the um, often difficult experience of quote unquote black Berliners in the Gesundheitssystem, in the health system here, but also on like uh, Afro-diasporic healing practices. And I think it was a very touching uh, um, exhibition, also the videos that were made with this. And then, um, then I, I had a couple of attempts to invite you to different events that I was organizing a couple of years, but it never really worked out. But this time it worked out, so I'm super um, happy and thankful that, that you made it, that you're here with us today. And um, Benno, um, uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Benno Brinkhaus uh, comes from the Charité. He specialized in internal medicine. Um, you have additional qualification in Naturopathie, or in German Naturheilkunde, and acupuncture. You studied in Vienna and Düsseldorf. Um, and since 2009, you're university professor for Naturopathie at the Charité. You're also the Deputy Director of the Institute for Social Medicine, Epidemiology and Health Economics and the Head of the Project Area Complementary and Integrative Medicine and the University Outpatient Clinic for Naturopathy at the Charité in Berlin. We met uh, this year or last year? Yes, last year um, in kind of the founding process of the International Society for Arts and Medicine with whom I've collaborated to kind of put this whole kind of program together, and I'm very happy that you're here. So to both of them, please a warm applause and welcome. <laughs> and now I would like um, you, um, Benno, to take the stage. I'll pre prepare. Uh, hopefully everything. should be fine. So, uh, stage is yours. Thank you okay. for being here. Thank you very much. Is the micro on? Yes. Okay. So, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Lucas. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm very excited because it's the first lecture not in the medical school. Um, but uh, I, I hope that I will transform the, the, the content I want to tell <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the, the lecture today is about uh, in expanding uh, concepts of medicine of all and of medicine. And I 
want to start with my buyer, with my CV. I started, as uh, Lucas said, in Vienna in Düsseldorf Medicine. And uh, after the fourth year of starting medicine, I get some, some kind of boring. It, it was uh, every time learning by heart, and uh, I was a little bit fed up with that. And uh, at the end, I switched to have also lessons in, in the uh, Kunstakademie in Düsseldorf, uh, because I found it much more creative, much more interesting. And so I did also some paintings there and, and started to make my mapper for, the, for, 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 for getting in the Düsseldorfer Kunstakademie. However, at the end of my study, I switched again to medicine because I get in contact with the patients and I saw, okay, medicine is also very interesting and I will continue going there. However, the rooms on the, of the Kunstakademie in Düsseldorf was quite interesting. It was creative, uh, very interesting professors there, Cornelis and Richter, and, and so it, it was an amazing time to be there. I get in contact with Josef Beuys in Düsseldorf, and uh, I'm sure you, you all well known of him, and uh, Beuys was already not there as a professor. However, the history of his time, he. He lectured there 11 years before he, he had to go out. Uh, and uh, it, uh, I will get in contact and uh, I'm learning also some ideas of him and I get more and more interested of him. And finally, um, as I switched then to, to Berlin and uh, to try to get my habilitation, my PhD, I get to get again more and more contact. And finally, my inaugural lecture of my habilitation was about boys because I thought I have not to, to bring something about my, my content, I have to bring something new. And uh, I started there to have Joseph Beuys, uh, a plural, plural, pluralism of methods as well in, in arts and medicine. And that was uh, quite amazing. So I keep on the, the contact to to this kind of arts. And what's always interested was for me that Josef Baus also told he was a shamas, shamane, shamanism, and he was also some kind of Gesundheitshelfer, uh, assistant of health, maybe, maybe you can just say. And uh, there's a, a citation of him, he say, I would say, what I practice can be transferred to medicine without, without further uh, do. So I think that's quite interesting that an artist say, I'm very close to medicine. What I think, it, it, it has to be with medicine. And of course, you know all the, um, the expanded concept of arts of Josef Beuys. And, and I will show you here on, on the left side, the conventional, concept of arts as it been 50 years ago in the Düsseldorfer Kunstakademie. There is an artist and it produces arts and that influences the society. On the other hand, it, the society reflects uh, the, uh, the, its contents about the art and the artist. And Josef Beuys said, no, that's not the topic. The topic is that jeder Mensch ist ein Künstler. Everybody is an artist, and we have a much bigger creation potential. As you can see here on the left side, you have a create activing, and you have also not only a society with, which is a, a construction with a stable, you have more a dynamic society, it's a, like a social organism, and it could be changed every time. And what I found is very interesting that he found it then the Free International University as a transport, as an institution, institution who should change our society into the direction of the social organism. So that was the kind what I found very interesting. And I think also what could be medicine um, with more an expanded medicine form. And uh, I, as I started medicine, it was very interesting to learn the conventional medicine, but I saw that many people also use other forms of medicine. 
like uh, traditional and complementary medicine. Complementary medicine as forms like homopathy, like naturopathy, like anthroposophic medicine, which is not integrated in uh, the conventional medicine, but it's very much used. You see about 60 to 70 percent of the German population use that kind of medicine. And uh, about 100,000 doctors okay, and uh, about 50,000 non-medical providers provide that kind of medicine. So uh, I found that very interesting and that was the reason why I gathered then, uh, then I went to the university and I wanted to study that kind of medicine, which is outside the conventional medicine. And uh, this kind of complementary and integrative medicine is much more used in chronic diseases. And in Germany, we have a very liberational law that say you can treat everyone with this method you can use, this, uh, if, the, if the patient agree and if the doctor agree. And in Germany, the most used is the naturopathy, naturheilkunde. Uh, more than manual therapy and homeopathy and acupuncture. And uh, here is a Naturheilkunde, as it is uh, stated in Germany a long time ago, it is the Naturheilkunde comes from the ancient medicine and you can see it, it uh, heals the patient with natural remedies taken from, from natural environment. You can see here, you can treat with healthy food, you can treat with um, uh, healthy activity or sports, with herbal medicine, with kind of water therapy, it's hydrotherapy, and all in the middle is the healthy lifestyle of the human being. And I think this is the most important thing for, 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 for being um, a healthy person, and to get again a healthy person. So we thought, how can we bring that together? And we think, okay, there's conventional medicine, of course we can use it, we have to use it for acute diseases. However, there we have some complementary and alternative medicine, and we test, we will test the complementary and alternative medicine, and if there are evidence-based, we can put them together to build an, a new medicine, some kind of integrative medicine. And uh, we want to, all to join also um, health promotion and, and preventive care. So at the last 10, 15, 20 years, we try to build a new form of medicine which is more expanded compared to the other um, conventional medicine. And we have here the definition of uh, Inter integrative medicine, and it's not only to bring this form together, the, this form of uh, complementary medicine and uh, conventional medicine, it has to focus also on the relationship between practitioner and patients, it has to focus on the whole person, it has to be preventive, of course, and health promoting, therapeutic, and have to change the lifestyle approaches. And we also want to bring back what we have before, this kind of healing art, the, the kind of that you learn uh, as, a, as a working, as a good conventional and uh, clinician. And uh, we think also that it's important to have a social and democratic um, basis of the art and that we have a natural and healthy environment. And that's, a, that's the basis of all. And we started to have an outpatient clinic at the Charité where we can treat patients, for example, with acupuncture and with Max Sebastian, it's also a form of acupuncture. And we have also osteopathy and hypnosis and herbal medicine. And uh, we have different um, definitions of health and the conventional medicine definition is a kind of materialistic um, uh, definition. It, it has a ground at the moment of the cellular pathology by Fircho and it says a healthy person is a, is a person who has absolutely perfect health in, uh, in, the, in his physician, a physical um, aspects uh, in his psycho aspects 
and uh, and, the, and you can see we're treating also with um, Chinese medicine. A Chinese medicine has a completely other health definition. It's more energetic medicine, and uh, uh, it has to be that you have a loss of energy or have too much energy, but it's it's not flowing. Uh, uh, very correctly, so the definitions between the conventional medicine and the Chinese medicine are quite different. And then we have also some kind of salutogenetic model where the, there's more a dynamic uh, health, um, health definition where we have uh, progressed between, um, uh, between health and um, disease. And that's what I want to show you here. That's the de de definition of the health concept. You have on the left side, we have the healthy aspect, then the less healthy, and the disease. And um, you have some um, risk factors, as I show here, like chronic stress. I think it's in our society one of the most um, important um, uh, risk factors. You have poor sleep, poor di diet and it affects the patient in a worse well. And if you have a disease and you have chronic stress, you get even worse. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, this kind of um, factors which, pr which um, um, can um, um, should, yeah, die Gesundheit, which can protect your uh, health. For example, with self-care, with healthy food, with nutritional um, aspects uh, with physical aspects and in the middle we have a multi-component interventions for the most diseases one therapeutic is not enough you need more you need more multi-component interventions and that's the aspect for you human, human humans but you can transport it also to our planet of course you can see here you have the same uh, health, less health and disease and you have on the right hand side again the risk factors we all well know for example the deforestation, the monoculture, um, the overuses of fertilizer and on the, right, uh, on the other side you have also these protecting factors and we have to use the protecting factors that the plan is, is not um, uh, went um, is going no uh, worse. So here you, I bring the concepts together. You see here on the one hand side again the health and the disease. We have the individual aspect to the family, the community, population, the planet and uh, all it works together. So if the planet is damaged you have also the problems with the, hum the, the individual, with the family, so um, it, it's a kind of work all together. So the whole influences every part and every part influences the whole. I think this is a very important aspect. At the end I wanted to say a little bit about research because we of course did a lot of clinical studies in our institute on complementary and integrative medicine and you can see here the fundamental fundamental aspects is the evidence-based medicine and it puts together, as you can see here, the patients, patient values and preferences. You have the clinical expertise and you have the best research evidence. And that's the kind of evidence-based medicine which is the most important aspect. And if you go to the best research evidence, you have some kind of quality of evidence which is on this kind of pyramid and uh, it's, uh, it starts with the background information and the expert uh, opinion to the case series to court studies and the, to randomized controlled trials and uh, of course we did at the, in the last 20 uh, years uh, we did lots of clinical trials randomized controlled trials and it's always discussed we did, in, in addition, also qualitative studies. However, now I come back to, to Joseph Beuys, who was also very critical about this, this kind of also only materialistic um, 
um, uh, concept of science. So he stated, actually, art is a, a practice. It means the actual natural science as I wanted to practice it. The fact that I took little pleasure in an isolated positive concept of science led me to seek out the plastic, which should be added to the positivistic concept of science. In this way, the expanded concept of art and the expanded concept of science can emerge in one swell, fell swoop. So, very interesting, um, I found this very interesting, and I always think that the, 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 this kind of science we do at the Charité, for example, at the moment in complementary medicine, has to be added another kind of um, um, uh, science, and we have to ve develop this other kind of science with kind of plastic, this, what he said, das Plastische, the plastic. We have to think about what can be happened. Could it be the, the, the creative human being and uh, what do you think about um, the science? So finally, I want to uh, show uh, two works of Josef Beuys which um, uh, impressed me seriously. One is a Schmerzensraum, Hinter dem Knochen wird gezählt. It's a work uh, in, uh, uh, manufactured by uh, uh, in 1983. Pain room behind the bone is counted. It's a room uh, which he leads plates uh, in a, a gallery and he put a light bulb in the middle and you can see a telephone there and uh, two silver um, rings uh, in different formats presenting the circumference of the head of a small child and an, and a, and an uh, adult people. And uh, for me, it's, it's very, I, I treat many um, pain patients and it's, for me it's very, um, it's, it's, it's a good picture for people who have serious um, pain diseases. And he stated, there's no question in my mind, the time bomb is ticking. Everything is ossified, that hardly any mov movement is possible. Yes, it's only behind the bones that we count. So, with, the, with this kind of uh, um, docu docu documenta work, uh, as he planted uh, 700 oaks, 7,000 oaks. Um, I think that's also a social plastic. I think it's also an environmental kunst. I think it's a very, um, very, uh, and it was 82, so it's a long time ago, and I think it, it was an important work. For me, art have po potential to reflect or to heal the individual, the collective, the society and the planet too, as also have medicine. And I think we need an expanded concept of science, a medical concept and of a, also a concept of art to, sol to solve the problems of our future. And uh, what, uh, with a hint, uh, there is an interesting exhibition about the Krankenhaus in Munich, um, uh, where if you are in Munich, you can have a look there. It's very quite interesting. I want to thank you for your attention. to stage and I already introduced to I just put a nicer backdrop um, so please come to the stage warm applause for and thank you so much Benno amazing talking points I, I can't thank wait you. for the discussion <laughs> can everyone hear me okay perfect um, I'm gonna just have a timer here so that I don't go too overboard. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you for my co-panelists as well and to the technicians for helping and for those who are listening. 
And part of my presentation, rather than having a PowerPoint, I kind of wanted to provide you with a general sense of my biography, as well as a, of why I do the various uh, projects that I've come to work on and how they relate to both the arts and the sciences. And so as um, uh, Lucas already mentioned, I've had a circuitous route, much of which has a lot to do with having been trained in the United States, but a lot of it also has to do with uh, my personal biography insofar that uh, I have always been curious about the world, I've always asked heaps of questions, and in some ways, and this is something I mentioned earlier, growing up in Miami was the thing that first introduced me to the, the natural sciences, um, very different from uh, Germany in the US uh, for most summers, uh, most students, young people end up doing this thing called summer camp. And in my case, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do marine biology summer camp um, at, from the age of 12 to about the age of 16, whereby I was able to explore the um, sea as if it was outer space with uh, marine biologists who allowed us to uh, count the amount of fish that we're exploring along the coast or to dive into coral reefs and in some case go camping in the Florida Keys. And part of why that was important, not just as a extracurricular activity or recreational activity as a child, but it allowed me to see myself as potentially um, asking questions um, in the same ways that scientists did. And it also fueled my research interest um, to then eventually uh, study biology. However, part of uh, my, biology, my own biography wasn't just about science in a traditional sense, but it also meant thinking about um, what role the sciences or the questions I had about the world had in shaping how we give and interact with each other. So for example, while I was uh, doing my uni um, education, I was able to uh, live in Portland, Oregon, um, organizing with anarchists, socialists, and other uh, people, which fueled my interest even more to think about biology not as an individual way of thinking about whether or not someone is ill or even um, if they're healthy, but rather how, how do the various aspects of our lives, whether we live in a working class neighborhood um, that might be polluted, um, or if we live in an upper class neighborhood that is, has lots of green space, how does that impact um, our life expectancy and so forth? And in, in my case, I was very much interested in thinking about science and disease and more specifically public health, uh, not just in the reflection of what I was seeing in the US, but also something that I witnessed, particularly in my parents' home of birth, which is um, the rise of HIV AIDS. And so for the, my master's program, I decided, well, why not look at the history of HIV in Haiti and also think about what it meant for certain groups, marginalized groups, low-income people, sex workers and so forth to really think about um, uh, preventative uh, care and sexual health as well as uh, testing and so forth. And part of the reason that um, I looked at HIV in Haiti and also New York City was because at the time that I was reading the literature and more um, in my master's program at Columbia, I noticed that um, the HIV AIDS at the time was being described as the modern plague. And part of it, the reason it was being described as such was because it, it a, uh, arose in a moment that was, it felt quite new in the 1980s. Um, it was impacting uh, portions of the population, um, at, at first mostly gay men, um, but also um, there were three other groups that were seen as being potentially uh, uh, arbiters of the disease and or more susceptible to it. Those other three groups were often labeled as hemophiliacs, um, um, intravenous drug users in some cases, and um, Haitians. And for me, I was quite struck by that, uh, that the Haitians were also seen as a risk group for HIV AIDS, which uh, wasn't actually biologically um, sound uh, at the time, but was only um, proposed as a risk group because of the what I would call, and other um, anthropologists, uh, historians have also remarked upon, uh, anti-black racism, uh, anti-Haitian sentiments, and other um, things that were happening. And this matters insofar as that um, looking at history and looking at how groups of people, including uh, people in, uh, that I knew, were 
vilified was important to then think deeper about histories, categories, um, the social kind of uh, determinants of health and what we could do more to um, not just understand the past but be better to each other in the present. Hence the reason that I then decided, okay, well, if I am interested in these, asking these questions about the past, it's then important to also explore um, a PhD in history of science more deeply, which is why um, for my PhD, I looked at the history of plague um, as a concept, um, not just within uh, North America or the Caribbean or even um, Europe, but thinking about plague um, as a concept within North Africa, the Middle East, and so forth. Um, and so that meant that I had to, to look at plague, um, not just as um, uh, well, how you say it in English, but also in Arabic, which is ta'un, um, in French, uh, which is la peste, uh, and also in the various languages that people um, expressed um, large epidemics in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and part of what, why this mattered and why it was important is because our understanding of medicine and disease um, and the sciences in the contemporary context is always evolving. Um, and, uh, and at this moment, it's always fast evolving because of the many things that researchers and physicians um, like uh, Dr. Benno are doing, which is to use um, various genetic sequencing and so forth. But what is important about history, I think, is to also think actively about uh, how, when people didn't know <laughs> how to heal the body or in the ways that we do now, or even when people weren't able to use um, uh, bacterial kind of analysis in order to understand what diseases they might be infected with. Nevertheless, um, I do, uh, we, owe, we owe a lot to our understandings of modern medicine from, um, ancient Egyptians, obviously, the Greeks, um, and indigenous populations that also use uh, many of the herbal remedies that are have been um, kind of integrated into um, traditional integrated and also complementary medicines in, in the ways that Dr. Benno, of course, is um, uh, an expertise at. And all of this is um, a very long biography for me to describe, but it, it, it really uh, is important for me to explain so that you can have a sense of why many of the collaborations I am involved in now aren't just a product of my educational training. If anything, uh, what we learn or what I learned in school, school was not the only way that I explored the world and it wasn't the only thing that allowed me to connect and collaborate with um, co my co-conspirators, one could call them. And so when I moved to um, Germany six and a half years ago, I did so as a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for History of Science. And it was there um, with the resources that were, were available that I was able to um, think, well, I, don't, I didn't wanna just work in the context of an academic institution, but rather I wanted the academic uh, space to be ruffled a bit and to allow um, that to um, ask questions about um, health and medicine, uh, specifically for people who had similar backgrounds to me, people who are migrants, um, people who are also creative, who are filmmakers and so forth. And the first project that um, was a very collaborative project was one in which I collaborate with the art, two artists, Vanessa Gravener, who's actually an alumni of Ureka and um, Nina Prader. And together we did a project called um, Scan the Difference that led to an exhibition in Vienna. And that was an important project because we asked the question of ourselves as feminists, as people who are living here, um, and in the case of uh, two of them, um, having also Jewish heritage, uh, what, did it, um, what does it mean for us to be read as femme, to move into different spaces, to feel like always under some form of surveillance, and how do we find ways of uh, decolonizing our practices, our bodies, and our minds? Um, and that project then led to another project, which um, uh, your professor mentioned as well, which was cartographies of care. And in that work, I really wanted to understand uh, what did it mean to be someone of the African diaspora in Germany, and more specifically Berlin, and to go to a doctor to um, suffer, in some cases, some people were dealing with mental or physical illness, to be transgender, and would it care 
mean and how do people in, um, um, use that for themselves. And rather than just doing a survey, um, again, we decided to have an exhibition and to really play with the senses. So um, I'm sure many of you are practicing art, artists, well, you are practicing artists and developing your art skills right now. Um, and and you always have to ask, like, to what extent um, I'm going to use one material versus the other? Uh, to what extent do I want to incorporate sound? And for us, um, uh, Nena and myself, we, we wanted to really push the boundaries of using all five senses or having all five senses be part of the exhibition and as a way to ensure that even if someone um, could not see or could not hear, that they would be able to touch something and at least um, in, uh, feel uh, aspects of our exhibition uh, through the senses. And uh, the one, one of the final kind of art exhibitions I've worked on of late was um, a project uh, called Mobile Fragments, and that exhibition was in Copenhagen with another collaborator, Luisa Prado, uh, who's also an alumni of Udeka. So I was working with a lot of Berlin-based artists um, who've, who've passed through this art institution. And in that one, we were really thinking about how our, um, how much knowledge we lost from our ancestors. Um, she is from originally from Brazil, born and raised there. I'm, I'm from Miami, but my parents are from the Caribbean. And we were really working through um, what does it mean to have African and indigenous ancestry and to not necessarily know all of the herbal remedies that um, our grandparents knew, or in some cases needed to use in order to induce an abortion and miscarriage. And we were also trying to work through issues around textile and how, what does it mean to create um, new materials um, from found objects. And so during that, that exhibition, we really worked through um, issues around um, reproduction, medicine, and oops, sorry. <laughs> and I also used um, some sound art to, to really allow space for people to enter ta that exhibition uh, with a sense of um, who we were uh, and what was missing from who we wanted to be. Uh, and part of why um, these uh, examples of Scanda Difference um, and Cartographies of Care and Mobile Fragments is important is because um, it allowed me to realize that any kind of project that I want to do that is visually based um, and is also oriented around a feminist practi practice um, can't be a solitary practice. And a lot of that is very much um, attributed to the types of theorists I look to, whether that's Sadia Hartman, who's an African-American um, uh, cultural writer, to uh, Catherine McKittrick, who's Canadian and has written an excellent book called Dear Science, which explores um, her journey and curiosity to uh, think about the natural sciences, even as someone who's in the humanities. Um, but it's also um, really engaging myself in literature. So I make it a point to read poetry every day, um, and I make it a point to also read novels, um, multiple novels, a week um, just so that I can see how are people thinking about some of the similar questions I'm thinking about, um, out, but out, not just in a visual sense, not just in a, a kind of nonfiction or political sense, but one in which they're trying to create beauty in the world and beauty within themselves. And um, I guess one of the, the last things I want to bring up as, by way of thinking about this interdisciplinary um, practice um, as both a sometimes artists and also sometimes um, uh, theorists and thinker, is that I also have been trying to, in a moment where I'm living in Germany, but I'm also still tied to the United States um, because that's the only place I have a citizenship. And last year, uh, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, many of the feminists I know um, globally have been really distraught by the the very um, attack on bodily autonomy and uh, that attack not just being around abortion, but around transgender issues, around uh, femicide, which happens even here in Europe, and other um, forms of gender-based oppression. And that was one of the many prod, um, kind of political moments or decisions that has actually inspired me to uh, not just write the book that um, was referenced, After Sex, which is an anthology around 
um, abortion, reproductive health, and so forth, but to now be working on a project that's looking at um, the relationship between art, reproduction, and, and science um, more broadly uh, as part of a fellowship. Uh, and what has been kind of difficult, especially if, we, if I'm thinking about my political practice now, is that w when I am writing about or thinking about questions around bodily autonomy and reproduction um, in a literary sense, uh, collaborating in the ways that I do for art can be quite difficult. And so it's in that respect or in that regard that I realize um, perhaps r art writing, which is what I've been doing for Freeze Magazine, can be a way to promote uh, people who are up and coming, people who are doing film, people who um, are performance artists as well. And that in many is, is helping to shape um, some of my practices now. Um, but uh, one final thing, which is to say that uh, art and science um, obviously are co constantly evolving. And in our previous conversation last week when the three of us spoke, um, I think the, the, a quote that has been very important for me in thinking about how I navigate through this world of curiosity, which I very much think is part of uh, scientific practice and what has l led me to study biology when I did, um, and also uh, what has also influenced me in the context of wanting to um, uh, indulge in the beautiful and be s of what is aesthetically pleasing, or in some ca cases, theoretically provocative in the arts, is uh, a very famous quote by George Braca, which um, I had shared last week with them. It's, and it's, he said, and he wrote, art obsessed and science reassures. And in a way, um, I used to take that quote as fact um, when I was 17, 18. Um, but now I, I see it as in the reverse, um, that um, Art can reassure and, and science can upset. And we've seen this uh, particularly in the light of um, the past three years and, and at the beginning of COVID. And yet what I think we can um, hopefully talk about a bit is just um, what does it mean to move between this world of both um, the visual um, as well as the scientific? How do we um, learn from the various um, our art producers, cultural writers, cultural thinkers, and the scientists who helped um, to, to make us and use a, allow us to use the spaces that we do. And then also, and I think this is um, where Catherine McKittrick's book, um, Dear Science, might be of use to some of you as well, is that uh, the sci scientific method and scientific thinking is not something that is just predicated to um, an educational institution. It's a, it's a way of asking the question so that you um, can learn from the world not just as a skeptic, but to really do the diligence of seeing um, what, how much we've come, how much we've come, um, uh, grown as humans, but also um, how can we build a better future um, in a caring way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So yes, please, Edna and Benno. Um, thank you so much oh. for um, a lot of talking points. <laughs> we, we will be fine <laughs> in a second. A, a lot of talking points. I'll try this time, last time I was more the mediator standing in front, I'll try to sit for a little here before I get you involved. Let's see how it works. I might start running around again. Um, Thank you, first of all, to, to both of you. Um, can we start with a very banal thing, but you mentioned uh, the, the reading of poetry or novels that you kind of make as a ritual. <laughs> w what's on your table currently? <laughs> so, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So, um, one of the things that I do is that I, I have a lot of friends who are poets and writers here, so um, of the living poets that I admire um, are include Tracy Fulad, who's b currently based here in Berlin, Camille Dungy, um, uh, Ada Limon, who, won the, who was a poet laureate in the United States, um, and so forth and so forth. And um, in terms of writers, I also try to read a lot of women writers, currently current ones, so Sheila Hetty, um, uh, Annie Ono, who's French, uh, Helen uh, Salou, who's written a, a work on, around angst. Um, but beyond that, I 
every so often, I would say once or twice a month, uh, try to read some of the classics and something that's outside of the culture and the framework that I've been accustomed to. So Anton Chekhov, I love his short stories. I've been really, really um, finding myself um, fascinated by his, his uh, terse writing, um, as well as a Canadian writer that I love is um, uh, Maggie Galant. Uh, so yeah, I just, I just try okay. to learn every, everything and absorb the world <laughs> as much well, as actually, I can. I, I will ask you for, uh, for the names. <laughs> okay. I can send them in, the, in our um, Moodle course, so to speak. I think <laughs> okay. I'm very always intrigued by the inspirations or influence of people. But this brings us also maybe mm -hmm. to what I thought was really, mm, for me, mind-opening already in our conversation last week that you brought in um, Boyce's expanded understanding of art, or Erweiterte Kunstbegriff in German, and his expanded understanding of science which you are the best example of, mm -hmm. in yeah. a way, no? also by yeah. just this weekly ritual or practice. Mm -hmm. But maybe you can kind of also just reflect upon what you heard from one another. Um, um, That's not a sign for me, no? Uh, are you I'm not sure your microphone. It's a day of technical difficulties, <laughs> but we'll, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah. This, this was really mind-opening for me because mm -hmm. that's uh, obviously something that we are trying to do here, develop an expanded understanding of both the arts and the sciences. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, th I think I we, we have to bring together the, uh, the science and, and the source of the science and, and the, uh, the ac uh, actual very materialistic part of science and, and to bring in more thoughts and creative uh, aspects and I think it's missing but you, you are on the way I think. It's, it's, I think we have to bring it into the medicine also. I think mm. there is also, we are, we are just focusing on, on, on organs and cellulars and, and more and more in, in, into enzymes and like this and, and we, are, we, are, we are losing the, the whole concept at, at the moment. So. I think this is uh, the task for also for the arts to mm -hmm. to find uh, also the aspects to to bring the creativity inside again. Mm -hmm. That's my my thought. Do, do you have an experience in in which way we can develop? You 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 saw the the history of science, and you you, you see it's it's also more and more going to in, into detail at, at the moment. In, in the in the conventional med medicine, maybe science. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm not going to directly answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, it, but I don't mean to be evasive. Um, but what I will say is that um, amongst practicing feminist artists that I know, um, or feminist theorists who are peripherally related to the arts. Um, so I'm thinking of like Elka Krasny at, in Vienna, who's a um, at the Vienna Academy of Arts, um, as well as, and she, she, for example, has written a book on um, uh, care and what does that concept mean more broadly, not just within um, medicine, but within mm -hmm. the arts and how feminists can use that. Um, and she, alongside with um, another uh, artist, or, or act with a practicing ar ar artist, Anna Bromley, who's based here in Germany, um, did a reparative archaeology workshop some years ago, about four years ago here in Berlin, and they were collaborating with and in conversation with the Coven Collective, which mm. is an art collective that's based here, and all of them were um, thinking about, okay, well, how do we understand everything from um, demystifying menstruation to um, figuring out how to create a transgender um, zine guide. And, you know, and so finding very, um, various different ways of using one's subculture and also one's artistic practice um, to develop, in some cases, practical ideas about what to do with the body and more specifically the femme and non-binary body. Um, as well as uh, how to how to be able to decolonize the way that mm. we um, work through uh, various forms of medicine. So, one of the things I've done in my work in um, is really thinking about what aspects of medicine have been quite harmful um, to 
racialize people, uh, whether it's like experiments that have, um, non-consensual experiments more specifically, that have been done on um, uh, people on the African continent to uh, ways in which people get discriminated when mm. in, um, for example, black mater maternal mortality in the US. So yeah, it's, it's co complicated, but I do think that artists are trying to do that work of asking the questions and then collaborating and figuring out what better ways to help each other yeah. in these areas. And with that, uh, we enter a highly political terrain, yeah. Yeah. which both of you actually opened up with Boyce, yeah. uh, who's not only a shaman, a healer, but also founded the Green Party. And I mm. mean, there's, there's a political connotation in everything that you do, basically. And that's something, if you remember, I spoke about in the very first introduction lecture that when we talk about healing, it's also a question of what, what is to be healed, what is sick, what is not sick, who says what is sick. So it, it's automatically a political um, discourse. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, find out a little bit more on your position there. There's, I mean, you, there were beautiful, a lot of beautiful quotes today, mm -hmm. you know? um, Another one that I remember, and I have to paraphrase it, was is Brecht, uh, the theater maker, mm -hmm. who said, like, art is not a mirror of society, but should be like the hammer to kind of hit and shape it with. So it is a very proactive kind of <laughs> usage of the arts mm -hmm. uh, as a political tool. Um, but how, like, in you're both coming, let's say, from the sciences. You're mingling in the arts. You are dealing with, also with, with the arts. What kind of obstacles do you face in this practice? Because let's say you're not the mainstream in what you do. No, where you come from, what your academic background is. So. Um, a obstacles, and again, mm. could you elaborate on that, like the political dimension of the discussion that we're having here on questions of healing, health, sickness, and so forth? I think the one, 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 one. Yeah, I think mm. I think one obstacle is I, I think the financial aspect, mm -hmm. you know, and the complementary medicine field. We have always problems to get some funding for our projects because we are not not uh, supporting the pharmaceutical industry. And with acupuncture, with hypnotherapy, you have always problems to get the money to, to, to fund this. And I think that's maybe also the same in, in art. If art wants to be so social uh, and get to get political, it's always difficult to, f to, to find, to get the money to, to change something. I think that's one of the main obstacles I might in my... Mm. I think I had, mine works. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think you're right that the material question in general in the arts is a major one when it comes to um, what can prevent people from being able to carry out a project. I think there's a lot of great ideas and um, Berlin is such a wonderful city where people are able to come and collaborate and exchange and experiment and make mistakes and I think that um, all artists should be able to have the opportunity to make mistakes and get messy and take the time um, that's necessary. But I think in of recent years, one of the major issues as well has been um, time and rest. Um, what does it mean to also have the space for artists to be able to take a step back and just to rest and do nothing? Because it's in the doing nothing that sometimes people are able to be the most prolific. Um, there's a book by um, Jenny Aldul, which is like um, how to do. It's called How to Do Nothing, and she. It's a re philosophical reflection on precisely what it means to take a step back and allow the mind to really bend and 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 be a sponge um, to the many ideas on the world. I think another obstacle too is um, for anyone who does collaborative work, which I've, like I said, I've done and I try to do as a feminist practice and often with people who are queer, um, non-binary and so forth, um, that what is it, to, to find a way to have consensus to, and to compromise is, is quite difficult um, because there are times where you debate, there are times that you may not um, agree on something and you want, and I, I at least want to um, be as caring as possible when I carry out a collaborative project and making sure you have the time to do that in, and respecting each other uh, is, is not always easy and um, it, if you don't, if you're on a time crunch or if you don't have the money, <laughs> it can be difficult um, and it can be an obstacle um, during a collaborative artistic uh, process. Yeah. Interestingly enough, you brought in the term of care now for the first time in 
in connection to collaborative practices. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe you can um, share your tricks, so to speak, how to, you know, how to engage in collaborative practice. For you, Ben, the question is: okay. Have you, apart from this like theoretical backdrop in Boyce, Weiter uh, Kunstbegriff and Wissenschaftsbegriff, um, have you um, have you actually actively collaborated with uh, artistic practitioners in your medical research yet? So this is has to, has to start. So so you, uh, you get the microphone. But I start I start with you maybe because collaboration is something that I'm very very much interested in. So this is the collaboration between arts and medicine, arts and science, etc. But generally, like you have a cheat code. Like what's your trick? What's your best experience in, in these these practices? Um, I can start while yeah. you get the microphone. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet necessarily to being able to say this is what one needs in order to do collaborative work. Um, because every dynamic is quite different insofar that whether I'm working with one person or three people or ten people um, and even just the different personalities and maybe one week we, we all feel great about everything in our lives and the next week that's not the case. Um, I think that what I have found generally works is being flexible and being open and, and, and also being humble and knowing how to say I'm sorry, that for me is the hardest. Because <laughs> I, I like to think I'm always right, but I'm not, apparently. <laughs> With, uh, so the humility question and the humility aspect is, um, is quite um, infor important and informative. Um, but then also, even before one starts a project, um, being able to sit down and say, why, why do we want to do this? And what is motivating us for this? What do you envision? What is your work practice? Like, what is your... Um, your, your way of working generally like, and if there's an emergency or if there's a problem, how do you communicate um, that you can't be involved or you can't, you can't do this specific thing? I think allowing space for ample communication um, and not rushing into things just because someone seems cool from the outside uh, is, is really important. Um, yeah, maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, I, th I think also the collaboration is uh, would be very nice. I think the, the what Boy said, the, the plastic. I think we we should think about what could be what could be the plastic. So mm -hmm. I'm very much in, in inside this kind of evidence-based medicine, this quantitative data and the qualitative data and, and the working. But I think the next step would to be to work together and and to find out what what can we. Uh, in, in which way we can um, fit something together with with this kind of v also conventional scientist uh, practice? I think that would be very nice. Mm -hmm. I would uh, would be very open, open, collaborate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, that would obviously would be the dream if, like, literally collaboration come mm -hmm. out of it. Um, and it's also, I mean, I'll ask one more question, guys. It's a longer one, and then it's you guys. Now get your questions ready, and then I'll come to you. Um, but um, I had this very provocative statement in the first introduction lecture, and we had discussed this too, that I said, like, simplified, you can say the sciences are evidence-based and the arts are ambivalence-based, mm -hmm. you know, because the one is based on data, so to speak, and the other one is exactly on the point that it's not provable. But maybe that's also not really right, I've been thinking. And you just had a quote, this art upsets science reassures mm -hmm. and coming to a realization, maybe actually art reassures and science <laughs> upsets. So, um, <laughs> yes, um, so what are the limitations of this provocative statements, science being evidence-based, the arts more being uh, um, ambivalence-based, in connection to that, and this picking up what you guys said is, and I think it's really, really interesting with your focus um, on the plagues, but also your focus mm -hmm. of these this aspro-diasporic uh, healing mm -hmm. practices in your background in complementary medicine or integrative medicine is these very different understandings of health and healing. We had this discussion with Jakob, my colleague here, before you guys came in. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe also core, like what do we actually understand as being healthy or what is healing about? Um, not only from a Western, but also from a non-Western perspective. You brought the traditional Chinese medicine, or like so to to elaborate of these different understandings and what they actually also bring along with it, and even what impact it has on the respective healthcare systems, like what the healthcare system in China, for example, um, is like compared to others or ours. Um, so this interrelation, our different understandings of. 
Who wants to go first? <laughs> and why not let you guys get your brains going? Um, the next. I, I think it's it's quite interesting because at the COVID crisis there was. Uh, um, I think we all hope that the conventional medicine works out some kind of immunization and uh, and it it was fantastic that the, this immunization comes so so quick and I was really astonished by, about that however um, after that the conventional medicines come to us and to say we are, we have post covid patients in our hospital mm -hmm. So many we, we don't know, uh, we, and uh, we, we we analyze them. However, we do not know what how how we can treat them, and uh, and the professors ask us and say, can, can you can you give them some energy? Can you give give them some uh, qigong? And they say, of course, they can <laughs> come, and uh, and we have lots of post-COVID patients, and we we did. Uh, in, in the last two years, we did a post-COVID study with Qigong and acupressure. Mm. So we tried, and we have uh, s serious damaged young people laying on bed and can can do nothing before they were uh, spotless. So so, and uh, and uh, there this this kind of definition of uh, if, uh, of health like an energy, you know, uh, the energy is an important aspect. If you have no energy. It's, it's nothing works. So I think there is a good complement. As you see, there's a there's a conventional medicine which treats the patients very good in a in an actual how in an actual situation in a damaged situation. However, if you if you have lost your energy, th the Western medicine has not, nothing else. So so I think this is a good example how. We can bring the, the the worlds together and and to to put out the, the best of of the worlds and and that would be also good to to put out the best of art and to to, to give it in the medicine and maybe the other way around. Because in the, sorry, in the, in the beginning you said virtue, kind of a materialistic kind of de definition of uh, uh, health, yeah. and the Chinese traditional medicine ener energy, energy based. Yeah. So that's yeah. a really d in different. Yeah. Um, perspective on the whole thing. Yeah, it's completely another, yeah. but it, it complements each other. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm like, first of all, it's, it's um, great to hear that you and your colleagues are trying your best to heal people who are dealing with many of the major um, difficult aftermaths of the COVID pandemic and um, in, in even just the amount of energy that it takes to heal people, like that is a very caring act. Um, so I commend, I like every time I see doctors, like friends of mine who are physicians, um, particularly in the UK and the US, they're overworked <laughs> and you know, it's, that's a reality um, that I uh, like to honor and reflect as like quite important to our society in this moment and also in, hopefully in the future. Um, but beyond that, I would say uh, when it comes to at least the history of science and medicine, um, as I've like written about uh, for more popular audiences as well as uh, for my dissertation, um, I've also been looking at and I kind of reference it uh, in moments in which um, the medical community has failed um, people or patients. So for example, one particular project that I've or one particular thing that I've been looking at in the 19th century in the US is that um, abortion didn't used to be criminalized before 1830. In fact, um, uh, anti-abortion laws as we understand them or decriminalization um, is actually quite a new phenomena in the history of the world. So, so long as people have been having sex, they've been trying to prevent abortions and to the, or preventing pregnancies or in some cases, uh, when we were, um, my collaborator Alice Falls and I were working on our book, um, After Sex, we also found that in ancient Greek, like people had condoms, like ancient condoms that were very uncomfortable, it looks like, but nevertheless were still being used. And one of the things that I was doing from a, the 19th century research is thinking about how did people get abortions, and often it was midwives, so people who, women who were often um, helping with deliveries, but also providing um, what uh, were contraceptions and also abortions. However, the American Medical Association, which had formed in the uh, late um, 19th century, uh, was also part of the anti-abortion crusade that was happening in the States at the time. 
And what, that, what they did was, um, A, push midwives out of the profession of caring um, within gynecology, but also um, helped to create anti-abortion laws in the U.S. context. Again, this is a specific U.S. model. Um, and that, that's a shame because rather than thinking, okay, um, like in an integrative approach, how can um, mostly male practicing physicians who are part of the American Medical Association collaborate with or work with the existing midwives, um, they decided to completely let them out of this field. And that's one of the many examples that um, I've been seeing in my research, at least as a historian of science, to see um, where it's, it's an unfortunate um, circumstance that actually put um, uh, gender uh, bodily autonomy um, back by, like, at that point, 100 years. So it was, it was quite unfortunate, but it's one of the many examples. Or even, um, and this is an, also an issue that happened in the, the U.S., which was the forced sterilization of um, uh, African-American, Puerto Rican, and some, and some indigenous groups in the um, early to mid 20th century on the basis of eugenics and um, the idea or sense that uh, people of African descent, indigenous people, and Latinx somehow were less than. And that was coordinated by scientists um, and the US government. And looking at those examples, whether it's the anti-abortion crusaders of the American Medical Association or sterilization campaigns, I think it's important to observe this so that ultimately it doesn't happen again and that rather than being reactionary within scientific communities, we should think expansively about how do we um, incorporate different forms of knowledge? How do we learn from each other? How do we have forms for debate and exchange? Um, as opposed to rejecting something or people that might on the surface appear different. Yeah. Okay, guys, who dares to break the ice? Yes, wonderful. Extra applause for the first question. Um, you ask, I will repeat it for our online audience so they can hear it, so please go ahead. Uh, so um, yeah, to repeat I, I, um, oh, for our online audience, so where are they, here or here? Yes, by the way, 80 plus people watching online. Oh, wow. So um, <laughs> uh, the, last, uh, the last quote that you gave about uh, science and art, could you say again from whom it was and what the quote was? So the quote was by George Braca, who's, who was a uh, French uh, artist, curator in the early 20th century, and he was very much connected to like the Dada and Surrealist movement. Um, peripherally, uh, ne nevertheless, and the quote was, art upsets and science reassures. Yeah, and a follow-up question, please. <laughs> <laughs> So how, how do you explore poetry? <laughs> so like I said, I, I think I, I feel lucky and privileged that a lot of the friends that I have um, are also creative um, in a wide sense, uh, whether they themselves are poets or nonfiction writers or journalists or uh, visual artists or musicians. And so, so various people I know have multiple, wear multiple hats. So if I consume poetry, um, I do so not Actually, I don't even like that word, like maybe consume, but if I'm trying to understand it, read it, absorb it, um, I do so you know, first and foremost by the people that I know who are creating it and to honor their labor and to really cherish um, the work that they produce. Um, but beyond that, you know, I, I, I still buy books, I go to the library. I, I do like the physicality of opening a text and exploring something new, even if that means um, going to a poetry section in a, a uh, bookstore and seeing something uh, fresh. And then I also do ex um, get on my email a poem a day, just like delivered to my email box as well. So there's also the online, I'm still a millennial, uh, so I, I definitely live in a, a virtual visual world. Um, there's also a poet, if you don't already follow this person, Maya Popa, um, and she has a substack um, whereby she 
as, she's a poet, she's a writer, she's a theorist, she does everything. She has a PhD, is currently at New York University, and she will always share poems like um, and on a, a, a certain theme, whether it's about September, or like the month of September, or about motherhood. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I get it, my poetry from everywhere because the world is, is quite expansive, so yeah. You. You're welcome. <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I have a question which is a little bit selfish because it's too dark for me to do my research. Maybe you have some suggestions. So, so I'm a dentist. I work in Charidad. And I can emphasize that uh, it's difficult to do research with when you work as a doctor. The amount of time you have available for research is very limited. Mm -hmm. Research um, in elderly care mm. and integrate uh, dentistry or a health in other like treatments of more communicable diseases. And I know I'm. This is a pretty new topic and something that in my department hasn't been studied before. So in two days I have a meeting with my supervisor. I want to finish. <laughs> I will try to sum it up for the online audience because <laughs> they can't hear you. It's very so it's wonderful. We have a dentist from the Charité here with a very practical question: how to how to convince your supervisor um, to push brain integrative and participatory research on elderly mm -hmm. people from a dentist's perspective. So this is a very <laughs> I'll pass on that practical. But thank you, lovely. This is the, this is exactly the right platform to ask these questions. <laughs> I think, Benno, you might be the one <laughs> to, yeah, <laughs> to, to yeah. answer this one. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, have you al already some thoughts about that? So first, um, do you have uh, any ideas to bring it? Uh, I, I just have a thought because we have a team, in our team we have two doctors who practice in hypnotherapy. Mm. And I think... Uh, Thinking about dental and dental pain and dental doctors, I always think um, maybe hypnotherapy makes any sense to, to 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 bring down the patients a little bit more. Um, maybe this is a, a w one of the ideas. Of course, other mind, other forms of mind-body medicine, meditation. Um, seems to be also good ideas or or some kinds of herbal medicine you can use maybe in the mouth so there's also um, mouth acupuncture um, <laughs> so, so i think there um, I, th I have some ideas so i think in two days it's uh <laughs> to make a concept in two days it's always difficult as i said before to not to only think about good ideas in 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 new science and but also to to think about um because um clinical studies are are very very expensive at the moment um are there any any foundations who would support kind of research so first a good idea second to look up the evidence and thirdly to make a project and to, to find funding, so that's well, I think that's the way. And but a, but a really good idea you can um, convince your your professor and say, okay, that's a great idea. We, we will be the first in the world who make hypnotherapy for uh, dental pain or extraction of the pain like that. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that in the beginning. Um, I don't know. Uh, I see the question. Is Johannes in here who got the wisdom tooth pull? 
No, okay, so, so I said this in the beginning, one of the students was inspired by the last talk, where it was all about music and healing and how it relaxes you, that he had his wisdom tooth pulled, inspired, also he had them pulled, but inspired by the last lecture, he had music um, playing to it, so mm -hmm. this might work as well. Maybe, maybe you compare classic music with heavy metal, so mm -hmm. to see. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, music therapy could be also a way. So, um, all the way in the back. Come to the front, yeah, wonderful, yeah. I hold the mic for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, content note, I have a big conflict with boys, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so I understood his, um, his theory that the power of healing in um, the power and the ability of healing lies in the patient. And, but this, in my understanding, also means the responsibility of healing lies in the patient. And so my question was, um, uh, do you think in traditional medicine or in alternative medicine, who has the more responsibility, the doctor or the patient? I think that's a good question. Um, I think in our society, um, which we have the, the this this kind of conventional medicine, and and you have the the health insurance companies, and they're paying everything for you. We we have lost the thoughts of rep um, responsibility, and I think we should have more and more the responsibility of of our health, and think. What can we do best for our health? And I think there, I, I, I showed there the, the this kind of um, uh, um, sports, uh, healthy nutrition, this kind of uh, uh, relaxation techniques. They're very important. However, th the patients do, do not use that, and I think we have to learn that back to to find that we are have we are responsible for our health not not the doctor primarily of course the doctor have also responsibility but but in, on the basic i think the the, the not the patients uh, the people in the society have the res responsibility but they give it up they say okay the doctors should have the res responsibility and i think a good doctor is a doctor who have uh, the, his um, patient for a longer time and try to, to help uh, him that he will be healthy and not getting, getting sick and I think that's that's the main aim and not coming in the in a situation where the where the acute um, problems there are. I think that's important but to, to stay healthy that's that's a main thing <laughs> um, actually, J Jakob, because uh, this is f picks um, uh, up the thread of the discussion that we had before. Do you want to uh, put this question in that we talked about the different health systems of whether you uh, whether you basically work as you just said as a doctor to there's a symptom and I'm working on it, or whether the job is more to prevent the symptoms even to come up to kind of be be healthy, quote unquote. Uh, so there's a sinologist sign and a philosopher uh, called Jaron Lanier, and he worked on ancient uh, Chinese philosophy. And um, he has this uh, thesis, um, he asked the question, why did, they, why did the ancient Chinese doctors, medical professionals, why did they even come to have a different uh, conception and different definition of, uh, of a disease? And he put forth the idea that in Western medicine, we think um, when, the, when the symptom occurs, occurs, that's the beginning of the disease, but they'd actually say when the symptom occurs, uh, that's the end of the disease. And the reason why they developed, maybe you can el elaborate a little more um, why they even developed this different perspective on, on health. What, uh, what was the reason? What was the fun fundamental difference? Why did they look in a different direction? Um, I, I think 
um, it, it lies in the concept of health. So if you, the, the, the Chinese doctors say, I can feel a uh, problem in the energy before you have any changes in your health. Uh, that's, I think that's a, a different. Uh, and uh, the Chinese doctors are feeling the, the pulse, for example, and the tongue. And uh, and a, a good Chinese medical doctor can see. Okay, I feeling I, I feel something before you have some changes in your cellular system. And if you have changes in the cellular system, it's very late, and you have to treat the patients much harder as if you change the energy. So th you know there are there are decocts and. Uh, uh, tea treatments, Chinese herbal medicine treatments, they are about 2,000 years and just and they are just working. Uh, and now you can, I, I treat some patients in our outpatient clinic, for example, with the post-COVID, and uh, you, you can treat them. There are good, good herbal med remedies for that. Um, <coughs> however, I think the, the to feel the energy and the, that the energy is not feeling in the right, in a harmonic way, is just the way to see before we see in, in the conventional medicine. So, so there are some doctors and see the tongue and say, okay, wow, um, I, I see uh, you, you should um, diagnose your, your stomach system. Maybe you have the problems there and they found something else. Just as a correction, that wasn't Jaron Lanier, but Francois Julien, mm. uh, the sinologist. And um, because I think, um, well, I heard, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I have heard that um, in ancient China there is a doctor, let's say um, we project that onto Berlin, and you are responsible for Neukölln. <laughs> and if, um, if nobody comes to your doctor's office, you get a certain amount of money, and the more people come, the less money you will get. So there was a natural um, homo economicus based reason uh, to make people not even appear at your office. And here it's the other way around. You get money for actually having people who are sick. Yes, I totally agree. That's our health system, you know. Uh, for example, you get more money if you, if, if you prescribe the patient to get an MRI. Um, but if you want to speak to a patient, you, go no, you get no money. So th I think that's something wrong in our health system. Yeah, and that's actually really interesting. Brigitte and then you, because um, if, if we push it, then it's literally that the one system um, works on s keeping you healthy while the other one treats the sick sicknesses, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a completely different approach. Brigitte, a question. So would you, should I give the mic? <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical about the idea, uh, to pick up on the question of responsibility, about the idea of the, the lifestyle, the wholesomeness being uh, part of the um, disposition of health. That sounds so um, liberatory or emancipatory, but it, isn't it also part of a... Um, neoliberal ideology that makes you responsible for your own health and if you don't eat well and if you don't uh, do sports and if you don't if you have the wrong sex in the case of the HIV AIDS discourse we know how the whole uh, discourse worked there about the wrong lifestyle um, so it's it's I think it's um, also quite liberating to re remember uh, Susan Sontag's intervention against mm -hmm giving sense uh, to illnesses by um, this more wholesome approach, by just saying there's a, m maybe a, the healthier way to have cancer is just have, a, call it cancer <laughs> that you, you know, instead of um, uh, ps psychologizing your lifestyle and the, you know, this mythology of, yeah, you might have uh, eaten your, t your, uh, emotions, uh, you might have to have suppressed your emotions instead of living them, and you know all this. The, the idea of lifestyle has so many um, 
um, regulatory um, aspects that even ideas of self-care can become pretty, um, uh, pretty much an extension of yeah, neoliberal <laughs> uh, interpolations of leading the right life. So I, I just would like to give some uh, no, no, contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I totally like the idea to bring, to let post-COVID patients experience a new flow of their energy, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, that's totally, of course, convincing and great you're doing that. And I was expecting that you hit on the virus thing. Uh, this is uh, uh, Breda Weingart is professor for media theory at the UDK here and has an expertise uh, in the virus, uh, the <laughs> viral aspect, and actually AIDS. Um, but um, maybe since uh, we get so many... Uh, oh, I already have a microphone. You, <laughs> <laughs> you get a microphone, I keep forgetting that, um, but uh, you go first. Okay, I can go first. Um, yeah, I think uh, similar to you, I am also a somewhat, um, not fully skeptical, but a, a bit um, resistant to the idea of individual responsibility because that's the very same discourse that gets used in the United States where 30 million people don't have health care because the government hasn't actually indicated that health is a human right. And in so doing, there's also just heaps of disparities based off of one's class background, neighborhood, et cetera. So um, when I was um, getting my master's of public health at um, Columbia University, one of, the, our, one of the ways we learned was also by um, working through the neighborhoods we lived in. So at the time, um, I was living in Harlem, and Harlem, historically black neighborhood, working class in many ways, but it's also because um, of how anti-black racism is also tied to environmental racism, it has meant that uh, many of the bus depots, or where the buses park, um, are in Harlem. Um, there was lead poisoning in some of the buildings because landlords didn't um, maintain them very well. Um, there were less grocery stores that provided fresh food and vegetables for people, and even when they did have them, it was far more expensive. And so you had, um, even as we were doing surveys, both as students, but also faculty members at the university in Harlem Hospital, they found that um, you could try really hard to be healthy in Harlem, and it would be quite difficult because of the classism and racism and environmental issues, and it caused things like um, disproportionate amounts of asthma rates in the community because of the air pollution from the bus depots, um, a higher rate of obesity uh, because of the, you know, the not having access to fresh foods and it was more expensive and people just couldn't afford to live. So you had multi-generational families living in apartments. So all of these structural barriers and that's an, a very extreme example in the Harlem case, but it, it could also apply here for people who are undocumented or asylum seekers or non-EU citizens who live yeah, in this yeah. country. And um, it, like, so I guess in a way when making the case for something like rather than, I would say, uh, individual responsibilities, how do we create societies where, at least from a public health perspective, we try to ensure that everyone has a basic wage, housing is a guaranteed right, healthcare is free upon demand, abortion is free upon demand, like, and it goes on and on, and then that could hopefully um, deal with some of the issues you brought up, which is like chronic stress and so forth, because when people are stressed just because they can barely survive, or their, their environment is polluted, it's, it's hard to think that, oh, if I just have the right mindset, then all will be better, you know? So that, at least that's, so, uh, that's where my, I would kind of support your skepticism. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree also, um, and I, I, I do not think that, I, I do not meant it dogmatic, uh, uh, as a dogma, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, I, I just meant that at the moment, the most people think I'm not responsible for my 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 health, and I I give my health responsibility to my doctor or to my to my health insurance company, <laughs> and I think that's not the right way. And I agree. If if you have pollution in in your in your in the in the air or in the in the where you live, you have a problem. But if you smoke, t uh, in addition, you have more even more the problem. So I think you you can try to change it, and and I think. It Bit more taking the responsibility. I, 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 I'm, I'm not a, a neoliberal person. <laughs> uh, uh, contradictory, but I think 
to take a little bit more the responsibility of your life, I think that's nothing to say against. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize neoliberalism was a dirty word. <laughs> I, but I would, I'm not one either, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to, to me they're actually uh, they're con cl complementary arguments rather than uh, contradictory. Uh, can I pass you the mic? Um, I have a question to Benno. Like you have a very clear idea of what a doctor should be, a person uh, to give the uh, patient his or her own um, ability to be healthy and uh, what if you tried uh, to make an analogy to artists um, who are at the moment in a system that very often has a similar um, structure, we discussed that in a, in a talk uh, uh, a couple of days ago, where um, yes, there are artists like me who don't have to sell um, um, Flachware, who don't have to sell um, uh, pieces of art, but uh, the big system is that you sell something and the other person buys it and gets it, and that's how the whole structure um, is made up like in um, medicine as well mm -hmm. so if you transfer this idea of a doctor to art what kind of an artist would that be? Actually you can both try <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, I think that's an excellent question, and it it actually reminds me of uh, one of the art of one of the authors I referenced, Sheila Hetty, and she has a book uh, that's called "How Should a Person Be," and it's a semi-autobiographical arts, literary, philosophical book uh, that um, it's her and her friends in Toronto, Canada working through being emerging artists um, and one of, and writers as well. And um, part of what they argue is that um, it's hard to be a, a good writer if you don't live in New York City or you kind of have to sell your soul as a, a, a painter um, in order to make it big um, or perhaps find a benefactor. And it, it's, a, it's very satirical. It's one of the funniest books I've ever read. Um, but it, it actually plays with um, the core to what your question is uh, asking, uh, which is the contradiction between wanting to be a creative and be perhaps better in the world but also realizing that you live under capitalism <laughs> and what does it mean to produce um, artistic and creative projects in a, in a world in which art markets are very much tied to a certain um, direction. Nevertheless, one thing I would say is that I think a bigger question uh, would be, and this is something that various artists that I know are, are working through, is how, do you pr how does one produce art or create um, artworks um, that don't contribute to the climate crisis um, and don't um, cause us to use toxic materials and don't and, and are able to work through um, nature in such a way that uh, in the, pro the art project the artwork or the art object it might be ephemeral it may not be something that lasts very long or is something that's more participatory collective or performance based um, and it's something that doesn't exist in an art museum so there's a broader set of questions um, about the the, imp um, the input we have on the world that is off can be quite destructive, even within the art world, even if it's not for profit, that actually raises b bigger questions around um, um, our carbon footprint and um, who has access to the work to begin with and who can even be defined or uh, as an artist, uh, which raises questions about um, gatekeeping institutions and so forth. Um, I don't have answers to <laughs> those questions except to, to add more questions to your, your, your sets of, um, your question. I just thought of the juxtapositions the other month in my 
Monday the evening lecture series. Last semester there was Emily Siegel here, mm. who um, is a writer, I think, a forecaster, and she had this really funny expression. She has a unresolved relationship with capitalism, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's kind of what we unfortunately all are in. in Monday, yeah. <laughs> Looking at the time, it's already eight o'clock again. Oh um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but this is always, uh, uh, as, as you, when you read uh, the books about boys, or the, this, yeah, is the this is always a ground problem, this, this, this th the thought about capitalism. And, uh, and I think, as, as I said, I think our medicine system reflects the capitalism per in a perfect mm -hmm. way, and maybe do it all through the art. And uh, can we change the medical system without in in, in our capital the capitalism system? I think that's a question. It's a main question. Uh, uh, and and I think it was it's very interesting because uh, the boys said that in in, in the eighties, uh, and there was a capitalism on the one hand side and the communism on the other hand side, and 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 he said and you know. I'm coming from Western Germany, and I always say, "Oh, the communism is, is bad. Mm, the capitalistic, yeah, the capitalistic system won." But, but we, I think we have this, this uh, strong feeling. I have strong feeling that that it, it has to come with something else, <laughs> an unsolved problem, yeah. as you said. I, I kind of end with a really d deep note from I don't know one of you guys. I, f I forgot not the name, but she wrote in her reflections. She mentioned the. Die ganze Kapitalismus Kacke. <laughs> <laughs> she said so that's kind of sums it up. But yeah. um, so looking at the time, I'm sure there's more questions, but I'd like to sum it up with maybe an open question that I didn't get to ask, but we can take with us because you had this really nice kind of scale of the individual, the, the society. We saw that also the last time. And you took it to a planetary level. So we spoke about kind of one health, planetary health. And that's maybe something for us to take with us also to think about that whatever we're discussing here, and that's kind of was, I think, quite evident that it's not on an individual basis, but there's larger societal, political backdrops, stories, hidden narratives uh, to be found. But that there's also, you, it was almost like an alchemistic kind of thing, this like as above, so below. So there's a microcosm in us, and there's this macrocosm out there. Uh, of planetary healing, but maybe that's some thought, uh, um, some thoughts to take with us mm -hmm. home. However, warm applause to our wonderful guests today, Edna Bonhomme and Hi. Benno Brinkhaus. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you uh, so much for coming. Uh, for our online audience who didn't ask any questions oh, yeah. today, no, 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 no. applause to you. <laughs> our <laughs> wonderful uh, technical <laughs> support team, the Studium Generale here, and to you, and uh, yeah. I see you all the next time. Thanks so much.